one had quoted the statement in the Gemara that one has an obligation if you see your fellow transgressing either due to not being aware he's doing the wrong thing or even if he knows he's doing the wrong thing but he's actually he's overtaken by his temptation, his desire a Jew has an obligation to inform him that he's transgressing and to explain to him that whatever he's doing is not really in his just, and it's a detriment to him. And initially, when you speak to him, you should speak to him slowly, be soft spoken, and explain to him the value of doing the right thing and the negativity of doing the wrong thing. He's able to gain a share in the world to come, and so on and so forth. So we explained that whenever you speak to someone, you have to speak to him at his level, within his capacity. There's always, everybody has this entry point that you're able to speak to a person. Person is more learned, you speak to him one way. Person has no relevance, as he discussed earlier, what we call the Timik Shenishba. A person who was captured by non-Jews, he doesn't even know he's Jewish. And now he, he realizes he's a Jew, and he has to be informed that his lifestyle cannot be the same now that he knows that he's a Jew. So you have to inform him. But the times within that mitzvah, even you have to admonish him, you have to rebuke him. And I always give the example. We read, we're going to read in, in Parshas B'chokosai, the upcoming Parsha, we read about the curses, God forbid, that come upon the Jewish people if we transgress and Hashem initially goes slowly. And then afterwards, if the person is still, def and he becomes defiant, it becomes much more severe. The punishment becomes more severe. So I always give the example, a, per a person is running, jogging, trotting, and he's going in a direction, and he doesn't realize that when he reaches a certain point, he's going to go off a cliff. At the pace he's running, he's not going to be able to stop himself when he reaches that point. So what do you do? You take a small pebble, and you throw it, and it whizzes by his ear, just to get his attention. First you call him, he doesn't hear. So you throw that pebble, it whizzes by his ear, and you hope to get his attention. Doesn't help. Person doesn't hear. So you take a better aim, and you take the pebble, small pebble, and you throw it, and it hits the edge of his ear, and all of a sudden he has a twang. He has a slight pain. He's engrossed. In running, doesn't even feel it. So what do you take? You take a larger stone, and you throw it, and you hit him in the back of the head. Because even though the pain may be excruciating, but versus going off the cliff, you're doing the, the person a favor, and he keeps going. He's so immersed in his exercise and his jogging, doesn't doesn't face him. He just keeps going. He's trying at the same pace. What do you do? You take a big stone and you throw it at his knees and knocks him to the ground. He falls on his face and he gets up, keeps going again, doesn't stop. But the man is jogging to his death. What do you do? You take a big boulder and you throw it at his feet and he's pinned under the boulder. And as a result of that, that's the way you're going to stop him in his tracks. This man is so bent to get to that finish line with the boulder. He's dragging himself on the, on the ground with the boulder on his feet. So what do you do? If he falls off the cliff, he's going to be smattered. His body's going to be in fragments. You know what you do? You put a boulder on his head and you crush his head. At least when you bury him, he'll be whole. And that's exactly what Hashem says in the Tocha. When I start informing you, you're doing the wrong thing, it comes slight, easy. You fall, you have an injury, you have a financial reversal, you have this, you have that. If that, that doesn't help, things become much more complicated, much more intense, all-consuming. And if God forbid, at the end of the day, person still doesn't turn around, God pulls the plug. But it's the same concept of tochocha. Initially, when you speak to a person slowly, gently, with love, with feeling, what happens to the person says, I'm not interested in hearing about it. I don't want you to meddle in my life. I don't want you to talk to me about this. Brother, you have an obligation to go back. 
as much as he tries to shoo you away, you got you have to come back. And then afterwards, but you're speaking nicely, gently, but afterwards you have to start speaking sternly and strongly, even to a point we'll see in a moment where you're going to embarrass him until the point he's about to hit you. When it reaches that point, then you step away. Now the rest is up. To, you've done yours. Now it's up to Hashem, the God, to carry through. You've done yours. He's already, your, 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 not your life's threatened, but now you could be actually, it's more than reaction. It's reaction in a physical way. Step away. So the Ramam says in number eight, Initially, when you speak to him, don't speak to him too sternly to the point that you embarrass him. What does this mean? Don't bring upon him to make him into a sinner. He should feel like he's not worthy of anything. Maybe initially when you admonish him, you rebuke him, actually his face turns colors due to embarrassment. Maybe even to that degree. No, you can't make him feel like a sinner. You're just coming, informing him that he's doing things which are not in his interest. You're not giving him a guilt trip. Guilt to the point where he's embarrassed. That you don't do. And it's not. And the Gemara tells us in one location that very few people are able to give to to speak appropriately to this kind of person. Because people, they overshoot the runway, as they say. They speak too strongly. From here we learn a Jew is not permitted to embarrass another Jew. Definitely not to embarrass him in public. As we we spoke about, a person does something very bad. So you're permitted to speak about him for constructive reasons to inform other people and to share his misbehavior with others, his transgressions. What about if you could speak to him before you go tell others, you're not permitted. Even though when you tell others, it's for constructive reasons. But if you could minimize the damage and don't paint that person in this negative light by speaking to him personally, and he may change his ways. Why tell the public? Why, why besmirch him in the public arena if he may, by speaking to him personally, you're able to correct it? Therefore, if you say it in the way you embarrass him, which you don't have to, or you do it publicly, what do you have to worry embarrassing publicly? There's no reason for it. If the only reason is you want him to change, you're able to bring about that result without embarrassment, why should you embarrass him? Unless you have an axe to grind. It's not for the sake that he should do the right thing. And that's why when a person speaks negatively about another person, if he means to take revenge or he has an axe to grind against that person and he enjoys Putting another person down, he's not permitted to say to say it over. This is although a person who embarrasses another person, he doesn't, he's not subject to lashes. Nevertheless, it's a great, it's a grave sin. Grave sin. Person embarrasses a fellow Jew in public, he forces his share in the world to come. The Gemara tells us it's almost it borders on what on, on taking his life. But a person face changes to that point that he feels like digging a hole and going into the hole. That's the degree that you hurt him. You forfeit your share in the world to come. The person has to be extra careful not to embarrass his fellow in a public setting. Whether he's a small person or whether he's a person of status, not a, it doesn't make a difference. You know, he, he's not worthy of honor. Does it really make a difference? Have I really diminished him? It doesn't make a difference. If you hurt him to that degree that he's embarrassed, whether he's a person of distinction, not distinction, you forfeit your share in the world to come. The low equal of shame menu, and you should not refer to him with a reference which will be embarrassing to cause embarrassment. Now, there used to be a word when we went to school, Nikon, Nikon poop. Remember, the guy's a Nikon poop. You know, 
And some of the teacher would call him that. Or a dunce. He's a dunce. These were words they used to use. And they were humiliating. But he's a child. Does it make a difference? You're not permitted. You keep the child, you put him, embarrass him in front of the whole class, in front of his peers. It's not acceptable. Lo yisab in front of Dov Shu Bosh Mimenu. Let's say he said, done something in the past. And by sharing with him, you embarrass him. You can't, you can't share it with him. Well, tell him something. Unless it has constructive value, you don't tell him that if he's embarrassed. No, the Gemara tells us that David Amelech, King David, the whole story with Basheva. So the Gemara tells us, David Chot Toys. Anybody says that David Amelech, King David, committed adultery, he's gravely mistaken. Because the whole story about Sheba, when he had relations with Basheva, she already was divorced by her husband. But he had many detractors. And David, King David was a leading Torah sage, the leading Torah sage of the, of the generation. And he had many enemies. And he could be speaking about any subject matter. And in the middle of the discussion, you're talking about the laws of Shabbos, talk about the laws of sacrifices, the laws of torts, whatever you talk about, they say, Excuse me, what's the law if a man commits adultery? What exactly is his status? They immediately they will interject this kind of, of, of question. It has no relevance. Why did they do it? They did it to embarrass him. And David was hurt. And David would say to them, a person commits adultery, even if that's true, he has a share in the world to come. But if you go embarrass a person, you understand? You forfeit your share in the world to come. I mean, even if what you're saying has some degree of validity to it, but you realize what 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 the ramification of your behavior is, the degree of transgression. That's what he would respond. So David, because he was suffering so, they would they, they didn't let up. They literally hounded him. See, pray to Hashem, allow my status to be known publicly that I'm innocent before I pass away. So David, Hashem says to David, in your lifetime it won't be known. But after you pass away, when your son will be king, King Solomon, it will be known to everyone that you're a tzaddik, and what they think you did, you didn't do. But not in your lifetime. What's the story? Who built the first temple? King Solomon built the first temple. He builds it. And now they're about to take the ark from the Mishkan and bring it into, into the temple. And in the temple, there were gates. And when they come to the Holy of Holies, the gate is closed. And the gate will not open under any circumstance. And here the Kohanim, the Leviim are carrying the Ark to put it into the Holy of Holies, which is its proper location. And the gates don't open. Shlomo Mel starts praying. Bishchus, in the merit of the patriarchs, in the merit of this, the merit of that, are the the gates will not open. In the merit of David, your servant, the moment he mentioned his father's names, and this is the presence of the whole Jewish people. This is the inauguration of the temple. As he says, in the merit of David, your servant, the gates open, they're able to bring the ark into the Holy of Holies. So it says at that moment, the enemies of David turned black like the bottom of a pot. Because then publicly they were proven wrong and it reflected on exactly who they were. That all the years that they made his life unbearable, they were they were the guilty ones. And they are the culprits. Okay? That's the story. See, here, even when you're doing it, when you're permitted to, you're giving him Musa. But if you don't have to hurt his feelings, and you do hurt his feelings, they're unjustified, they're, they're consequences, bad consequences. So to say, even to say something of the past which will embarrass him, you know, the, the Gemara tells us that a person is about tshuva, and when he becomes about tshuva, he even changes his name. His name used to be Patrick. Now he says, my name is Pesach. Pesach, no longer Patrick. 
His name used to be Chris, now it's Chaim. And they say, hey, Chris, how are you doing? He says, I'm no longer that person. That person, I, I, I'm not associated with that person anymore. It's because his past pains him. He doesn't want in any way to identify with that past. So if you share with him something of the past, which brings, brings him back there, he doesn't want to go back there, you're not permitted. So to, to say anything or refer to anything, which will cause him that level of embarrassment, so you say, well, he shouldn't really be embarrassed. If it would be me, I wouldn't be embarrassed. You know, it's around what you would be. But if actually, if you're inflicting that level of pain on that, whether it's even though it's emotional, it doesn't make a difference. It's a Torah violation. You're not permitted to do it. That's lo sisel of chet. It's a negative commandment. The man for mamurim, bedvorim shemin on lechaveru. That's between man and fellow. Avod divri shamayim, but regarding between man and God, im lo chazabo b'seiser. You speak to him, you talk yourself blue in the face. And he still continues doing the wrong thing. Then already, even if you have to embarrass him, you don't start there. You make him uncomfortable, even in a public setting. And you make his sin known. Even if it means you're disgracing him in his presence. You do whatever you have to do till he re re returns to a proper path. As all the prophets, when they rebuked the Jewish people, of course, they did idolatry, they did terrible things. They, they rebuked them till they wanted to actually kill the prophets to that degree. In terms of ourselves, today, the vast majority of Jews are not observant Jews. We know they violate the Shabbos. You pass by a restaurant. Kosher style. Right? Jews are eating there. They're eating that kosher. You go in and tell them they're doing the wrong thing. They'll, first, they'll throw you down your head. That's number one. But besides, we don't. You see Jews driving in a car on Shabbos. You see Jews leaving the, the shul and hailing a taxi or calling a Uber before they leave the shul to be able to be picked up by an Uber. N nobody even says a word. We're there, it's easy because you know the people. You do it gently, softly. So you're right, many situations we, we do the wrong thing by not saying anything. But to go beyond that, we don't. Because again, the way it's because most things, situations, the person is so shut down, as much as we talk ourselves, they don't they, they can't even relate to it. You know, you tell a person it's not kosher. The person doesn't even believe Torah min Hashemaim, the Torah is divine. They think it's folklore, they think it's uh, a nice custom. That's about it. You have to be really be an expert in how to even present it and to say it, and not to offend the person. And the person that has to understand it's for him. It's not that you want to in any way take control of his life to dictate to him. Therefore, at best, you should say something gently in a nice way. Otherwise, sometimes the person says, you know, you antagonize him. And if you antagonize him, so what's the consequence of antagonizing? He's become a worse Jew. I mean, he's not observant at all. He said, hate Judaism. Because he's look at religious Jews as being extreme. And today, how does he look at them? You think he'll look at them as more extreme or less extreme? It's totally irrelevant. But as they say, only God knows. And at times, we should say something, we don't say things. Because it's not acceptable. Example. Somebody asks a rabbi to officiate at his wedding. Orthodox rabbi. Person is not observant. The wedding is not even kosher. It's not going to be a kosher wedding. But the groom and bride will provide a kosher meal for the rabbi when he comes. 
Is it appropriate for that rabbi to fish at that wedding? Definitely not. Definitely not. It's Chil Hashem. If they don't even have the degree of respect to have a kosher wedding, dietary-wise, and have a rabbi coming, and he's put in a position where he sees everybody violating what he represents, find yourself another rabbi. But my grandmother would have wanted it should be a traditional ceremony. But your grandmother would have wanted it should be a kosher wedding also. It goes hand in hand. Sometimes people, they make big mistakes. The law is that if a person is married with two kosher witnesses, the woman is a married woman. If a woman's married, but she's not legally, halachically divorced, she's, she, she's a married woman. If she has any sexual relationship with anyone, it's considered adultery. But that's only if the original marriage was a valid marriage. What happens if the witnesses at the ceremony were not kosher witnesses? Although they went through all the protocols of what an Orthodox marriage is, it's not a marriage. As a result of that, if now, God forbid, if she could she commit adultery, it's not adultery. She's civilly married to this person and she's broken her commitment to her spouse, her secular spouse. It's not a Jewish spouse. So some people say, no, you should have make sure to have kosher witnesses. In terms of the rate of divorce, the statistic, very often the marriages fall apart after a short period of time. And ultimately, during till they get, even even if they get a get, till they get to get, it may take a while. And the woman has any relationship with any other man, she's committed adultery. So what should have been the, the advice to that person? To have kosher witnesses? Well, not to have kosher witnesses. Do whatever you want, but don't advise them to have kosher witnesses because if that's the case, you're actually contributing to a situation which is the most extreme in terms of transgression. You're the cause that later there's going to be an adulterous event taking place. Again, as Rabbi Shoslampa says, you know, the fifth volume of Shulchan Aruch was never, was never printed. It's called Seichel. You have to have foresight. What to say, what not to say. You don't encourage this. I was once at a wedding, and it wasn't so simple. It was a kosher wedding, and it wasn't simple that the whether these two people were even permitted to be together. The bride and groom. Because there was a question on the conversion of the mother, this and that, and I was, I was, and I had a relationship with the family, and I was con concerned that they would call me up for a, a bracha under the chuppah. If it's not a valid marriage, you know, it's a bracha of atola. You're saying a bracha in, in vain. So I, I was, I, I was prepared to say, except I'm sorry, I can't accept the bracha, but my, you know, I have a sore throat, I have a, a horse throat, my voice doesn't carry. Whatever it was, they'll tell me they have a mic. I'll say whatever it is. So it turns out this rabbi, he, I was thankful. He says, this rabbi, his, his he says all the brachas. This rabbi said all the brachas on the chup. I was thankful, or Hashem, that I wasn't put in that position. Not that I would have said, I wouldn't have said the bracha, but I'm just saying. People think what, when. You have to have that understanding. When do you say, when don't you say and the Gemara tells us, just as it's a mitzvah to say what you should say, there's a mitzvah not to say what you should not say. To remain silent. Somebody sinned against his fellow, and he did not want to inform him that he did the wrong thing. Because the sinner was so detached from knowing the wrong he had done, he doesn't want to say anything to him. Person says something to you which was hurtful. Person that doesn't even realize, and even if you speak to him, he's out of touch. He's out of touch. Or he was distracted. He's totally confused, a confused type person. And the person who was the victim of this wrong. He forgave him. And his heart forgave him. He has no ill feeling towards him, but he didn't rebuke him. Did not 
Hareze Midas Hasidus. Hear this? This is considered extremely pious. Person hurts you and you immediately. I understand he doesn't know any better. He's innocent. He didn't mean it. Even though you hurt. You forgive him in your heart and you don't say a word. Hashem sees you as a chosid. Scrupulously pious. Meaning only if you have that ill feeling, that negative feeling, that's when you have to tell him. But if he himself, you feel, you forgive him immediately, you don't have to say a word to him. I'll tell you an interesting story I had. There's a certain woman, which I know, and her father was a very wealthy man. I mean, this woman today is in about, about 70 years old, but her father was very wealthy. And somebody else was in the gold business. And we're talking about 47th Street. And this person borrowed a tremendous amount of gold for manufacturing. And then the borrower had reversals. And the, her father passed away. And this man owes a tremendous amount of money to the family. It's part of the inheritance. They inherit their, their, their creditors. The man continues living his life at a very high level and doesn't address the debt whatsoever. You know, they meet and they don't want to say anything. They don't want to lock horns with him. And he acts and behaves like nothing ever happened. It, it's 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 corrosive. They were actually suffering suffering about it. So it came before Yom Kippur for Shoshana, and she shared she shared it with me. So she asked me what should she do. So I said very simple. It cited that when it comes to Roshano, Yom Kippur, if a person to be held accountable because you didn't forgive him, as much as the person deserves to be punished. But if a person, if God is 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 considered like a father to the Jewish people, and if he has to punish his child because his child misbehaved, because there's a claimant against him, so you're the cause that God has to be pained. So to the degree, there's a level of liability to the one who didn't forgive. So what should she do? We're talking about forgiving something millions of dollars worth of debt. I said, very simple. That forgive him that that he did the wrong thing, that he behaves like he owes nothing. Forgive him. Forgive him on that. But you're not forgiving the debt. The debt he owes you the money. The money you're not letting go. You're not waiving the debt. So he's a debtor, okay. But that that he behaves like, which is unacceptable, which is unconscionable, that you waive. Don't have a claim against him. As a result of that, he's not held accountable for that because you waived it. And what? But still, you have a claim against his estate or whatever it is for that amount of money because it's documented that that person owes that amount of money to the family. That's what I advised. So I was saying, if you forgive a person in your heart rather than having a claim and rebuking him, that's a chosid. Because the person is only held accountable and he has to be told if the person feels that negative feeling towards him and the person has to make, make right on it. I forgive you. That's the end of the story. There's a famous story with the one of the Talmud and one of the students of Darizal who was a very holy man. The inner circle of Darizal, the real capitalists. And somebody had offended one of his students unjustified. So the Arvizal goes to his Talmud and says to this person, exactly what I'm, what I'm telling you, it's before Shani you should forgive him. On the day of judgment, you don't want he should be accountable for what he did wrong for you. To you. That was the advice that Arizal had given to this close student of his. So the student said that Arizal, when he had hurt me and offended me and did the wrong, initially... I did not allow it to affect me. I never had a claim. Even from the first moment, I never had a claim. He doesn't need forgiveness. It's not, I had a claim and I forgave him my heart. 
He, I did not even need forgiveness because initially when he did it, I it was like water off a dog's back. I totally deflected it. Didn't affect me. I wouldn't allow it to affect me. So when Arizal heard this, he was proud of his Talmud. His Talmud, it was saying, when you have a claim, you forgive it, you let it go, you're a chosid. So initially, you don't even, there should even be a trace that there ever was a claim. It's a very special level that the person's at. You know what level of Avas Yisrael you have to have? If you love your fellow like you love yourself, your child does something. You let it go. It may be hurtful, but you let it go. It's your child. You love your child. So if you love your fellow as you love yourself, especially when it comes to Hashem, we'll punish him because of that. There's no question. You love your father. You don't want to cause him any pain. Any negative feeling. Because he's pained when he has to punish his children. As much as it has to be done. Rule number 10. Chayv odom lizor b'yisomim v'almonos. One has to be extra careful dealing with orphans or widows. That's explicit in the Torah, in Parshish Mishpotim. Because their spirit is extremely low because of their predicament. A person is an orphan, he has nobody to defend for him. And as a result of that, very often, he's victimized by people. The way he's treated, the way he's ignored. A widow. A woman, she has a husband. The husband protects her. Protects her honor or she feels honored. Now she feels she's what? She's all by herself. And people as well are not sensitive to her feelings. Because she's a widow. The Rucham, Rucham Nemucham. They have a very low spirit. Low spirited. What about if the woman's a wealthy woman? The orphan is an heir to a large amount of money, but he's still an orphan. He still is bereft. He has no father. And he has a level of sensitivity. He's sensitive because of his predicament. What about if the princess, she's, she's the queen, the queen mother, and the princes are minors and they're orphans. Musorin Ono Aleim, we have this, we're forewarned to be sensitive, how careful we have to deal with these people, irrelevant of their financial status. Rabbi, excuse me. Is the definition is the definition of an orphan losing one parent or both parents? Or just a father? Just a father. So just a father. So if you lose a you mother, know, the you're mother, not an orphan. The mother is a widow like the like the child is an orphan. We don't say a man who loses his wife, you have to treat him differently than a man who has a wife. It's only the woman who loses the husband. I see. Okay. Shenemar. Kolamona Viosulosanun. The Torah tells us any widow says call any, whatever his status is in society. He could be an ordinary person, could be a prince. If the woman's a widow, or the, now what's an orphan? An orphan's a person, even if he's an adult, but he's not secure. He cannot earn his own keep. He cannot maintain his own status. He cannot stand up for himself. He hasn't reached that level of development. Lo sanun, you're not permitted to afflict that person. So how do you deal with them? When you speak to them, you speak to them softly. Soft tone. And you treat them with respect. You know, child's an orphan. Hey, sonny boy, get over here. It's not the way you speak to him. Would you speak to your own ch child that way? You may speak to other children this way. But this child, when you call him sonny boy... He he feels he's only being referred to that, not by name, because he doesn't he's an orphan. My father of Shalom was an orphan when he was six years old. And he really was the brunt of society because he was an orphan. And he used to say, if you ever take a look picture of Jews in ghettos in the ghettos in Europe, 
had there were certain indicators that a, a child was an orphan. What was the indicator he was an orphan? In the olden days, people wore hats. Wore hats. If the hat went over the ears of the child, you knew he was an orphan. The hat didn't fit. It was too big. If he wore pants that the cuffs were rolled up about six times, you knew he was an orphan. And he had a piece of rope as a belt, you knew he was an orphan. Nobody was taking care of him. This He was in a survival mode. So you see these kids, you saw them as a bunch of, of, of whatever it is, as ruffians. And you don't treat them with respect because you immediately you classify them as what? You stereotype them. And because of that, you're less sensitive to them. It was a case, I'm not going to mention the synagogue. You know, there should be a certain decorum in the shul. And you have certain people who are wealthy. They bring their children to shul. They literally disrupt the service to a degree. They don't sit next to the parents. They walk around. And they don't act properly. Nobody says a word to the parent. And there's another person which, you know, he's a good person, earns a an appropriate livelihood, nothing to, to write home about. If his child should speak or disturb the service as much as Nyota, they immediately reprimand the father, reprimand him. No, if you can't take care of your, your kid, don't bring him to shul. What about the rich guy? The rich guy's kids turn the shul upside down. Not a word. What are you picking on this man? It's it's similar. That it's a Torah violation. Now he's he's not, but you you're actually you're you're actually aggrieving him by singling him out because he he's not. You make him feel like he's less. It's the wrong thing. Because if you have one rule, how do you stop making differentiations? Well, you speak to them softly. And treat them only with appropriate respect. Always the most respectful way. A woman's waiting to speak to you. You, know, you give her the courtesy. You speak to her first. Don't let her wait like everybody else waits. As long as you're not infringing on other people, people don't react. They don't understand. Sometimes it's just too bad. Because they themselves have an obligation to allow to treat this woman. They should treat her also with greater sensitivity. You should not give tasks which cause them pain, which cause them distress. My father, he was an orphan. When he was 12 years old, he was walk, working for a wealthy man. And the person was supposedly an Orthodox Jew, worked for eight dollars a week. Could you imagine? Eight dollars a week, and he would work maybe six, he would work eight hours a day, ten hours a day. And if let's say he stocked the shelves, whatever he did when he was 12, 13 years old, the boss didn't want him to surround doing nothing. He's paying a wage, he's paying what a nickel an hour, whatever he paid him. Uh, re redo redo the shelves. Now rearrange it. I mean, the merchandise is perfect on the shelf. Do this, do that. Bring it, bring it down, bring it up. What's going on over here? So because he was he was an orphan, he had to fend for himself when he was ten years old already. He he was being abused. It's a terror violation. And this person, he had a son-in-law, became a rabbi. In those days, to buy a set of Talmud, before it was printed in the United States, he had to import it from Europe. And he was a rich man. And he prided himself that he wanted that he bought a son-in-law, a set of Shas, a set of Talmud. And he's painting, and he's actually giving distress to my father. And when it came to pay the wage, he didn't pay him on time. And there were times that even shortchanged him. He didn't give him the full wage where he worked like a slave all week for that $8 a week. But why would he take advantage? If he would have had a father to stick up for him, 
with it help doesn't make a difference, but he was he was all by himself. It, well, the world's bereft. He was bereft. How do you get that sensitive? Years ago, there was a woman, and after the story, she was divorced, and the husband raked her over the coals in terms of the settlement, financial settlement. Really raked her over the coals. And she would come with her mother to complain to me. I knew the I knew the husband. So there's an expression in Yiddish, the Abish Dahut Cheshbin. God keeps keeps the keep keeps the keeps the tab. Nothing goes unseen by God. You're mistreated, you're being abused, you need the money to cover your expenses. God sees everything. Why is he interceding on your behalf? We don't have all the answers. But the Abish the Halt Cheshbin. Hashem keeps keeps the cheshbon. He keeps the calculation. He, he keeps the tab. Someday, when it comes when it comes pay, pay day, reckoning day, this is on the account. So you don't feel although you're being and you're being whatever for whatever reason, Hashem has his reasons. We don't have all the answers. And that's it. But even though there's a reason why you may be affected negatively, but that doesn't justify the victimizer to turn the other person into a victim. It's two separate things.